Okay, awesome. Uh, greetings, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 13th Tufts China US Symposium. My name is Jerry and I'm the director of Tufts Search. The Tufts China US Symposium is a two day academic conference held every spring by Search. Our goal is to foster academic understanding of China and cultivate cooperation between students, experts, and policy practitioners from different backgrounds and cultures. We wish to create a unique crossroad of ideas, experiences, and people that characterize Tufts University and to promote an atmosphere of deep analysis and critical awareness. I want to apologize for not being able to host you at our beautiful Memphis campus. In the past, this event is held in person. There are drinks, snacks, and other refreshments. And after the conference, all the uh, students and speakers gather together for dinner in a room that has superb view uh, of Cambridge and the Boston skyline. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this year's symposium will be our first and hopefully our last remote symposium. The theme of this year's symposium is crisis and opportunity. The Sino-US relations are in deep crisis. The two countries spat and confronted each other on almost every subject, on trade, technology, human rights, to China's foreign time claims. The Biden administration has made it clear its intention to pursue strategic competition with China, yet at the same time, opportunities for engagement remain. So many areas where the two superpowers can cooperate for the interest of the global community from, global, from the current global health crisis and climate change. We hope that this symposium will provide a platform for all to consider and better understand these issues and the future of Sino-US relations. So under that theme, this year's symposium will explore a variety of topics from the Chinese movie industry in the culture panel, which will be held later today, to the security panel, which will explore China's naval buildup and its maritime strategy, to the econ panel, of which the topic is the prospects of the economic divergence between the West and China. For more detailed information about this year's symposium, schedule, panels, and speakers, you can find them in our program booklet. Uh, I'm sending it to the chat. Uh, give me a second. Here we go. Uh, our first panel today is the David Rawson Memorial Lecture. This is the symposium's keynote speech and will be presented this year by Mr. James Pamler, Deputy Editor of Foreign Policy. Now, before we get started, uh, let's hear from my deputy Dash, who will introduce the background and purpose of the David Rawson lecture. Great, thank you, Jerry. So every year we're excited to, to present the David Rawson Memorial Lecture. Um, so it's a keynote lecture commemorating David Rawson, who was a tough student, a member of the class of 2007, whose life tragically ended uh, the summer after his graduation. He was an international relations major, graduated cum laude, and was an early member of Surge um, and studied abroad in Hong Kong. So a deep uh, love for, for this group um, and the US and China. He was involved a lot on campus, was a talented tenor with the Tufts Chamber Singers for four years, acted in drama performances, and wrote for um, lots of campus pub publications. Um, and he was in the process of applying to become a U.S. officer in the Navy. Um, he, he, was, he was applying to become um, a U.S. officer, Navy candidate, um, intelligent officer when he passed away in the summer of uh, 2000. So that's a little bit of background on um, the, the lecture itself. Um, and now I'll uh, introduce um, James Palmer. Um, or, and now Jerry, Jerry rejoined, he's having some, some technical difficulty. So I'll pass it back to Jerry and have him introduce um, Mr. James Palmer. Thank you, Dad. Sorry about the earlier, uh, my internet just jumped off and the audio 
went off as well. So this year's uh, David Rawson uh, Memorial Lecture will be presented by Mr. James Palmer. He is the deputy editor at Foreign Policy. Uh, as a journalist, he has extensive experience living in and reporting on China. He is, he is the author of The Bloody White Baron, the extraordinary story of the Russian nobleman who became the last Khan of, the Mon of Mongolia and the death of Mao, the Tangshan earthquake and the birth of the new China. Uh, Mr. Pamela uh, won the Shiva Nepal Prize for travel writing in 2003. He had worked in previously in Chinese newspaper and is currently a uh, deputy editor at Foreign Policy. So Mr. Pamela will give us a 30 to 40 minutes lecture followed by a Q&A. So without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Pamela. Thank you so much, Jay. So today we're going to talk about the US-China relationship and about the questions of knowledge. Who knows what on each side? How does each side perceive each other? And what are their perceptions of the future? Because we're at a point now where China-US relations are at a crisis point like nothing we've seen for maybe 50 years. Uh, the level of tensions has ratcheted up continuously over the last four years. Um, in the last month alone, I would say um, the Chinese rhetoric, the Chinese tone um, has taken on an even more aggressive uh, tone, uh, turn, um, both against the US and against other Western allies of the US, such as Australia and Canada. Part of which, of course, is this extraordinary pushback against the uh, designation of the crackdown in Xinjiang as a genocide. And we've seen a full-throated kind of retort from the Chinese state on that, using every means at its disposal. But this confrontation has been coming for some time. The Contradiction between a US that believed it could remake China essentially in its image as a westernized, democratized power through engagement and a Chinese party state determined to stick to its guns, determined that the survival of the party and the power of the party was the overwhelming factor that would shape a, new, uh, a newly powerful China and determined to, to use China's power to force the rest of the world to accept the limitations of the party state. That's been on a collision course for 20 or 30 years, a collision course that Americans didn't really realize was happening until, that, until maybe as late as 2014, 2015, a huge number of members of the Western establishment particularly on the business and the diplomatic side, deeply believed in a China that would accommodate itself to the rest of the world. And the answer instead that they got was that the rest of the world had to accommodate itself to China. That's something that they weren't expecting and something that all their actions of the last 10, 20 years left them um, extremely open to uh, and unprepared for. So now we have this point at which um, the US is collectively almost panicking about Chinese power. We've seen from both parties the rhetoric of Chinese influence, of Chinese threat, of China's growing presence in the world. We've seen talk about how Taiwan is in danger of being invaded within the next uh, four to six years. We've seen discussion of how the Chinese military is getting to a point where it can conceivably challenge the US military, um, either some claim globally or in China's own backyard. And on, the, uh, and on the Chinese side, we've seen a um, massive hardening of attitudes towards the outside world. 10 years ago, the notion that China had something to learn from the outside was still pretty common inside Chinese circles. 
uh, that China could imitate other people's systems, could reform its own failed policies, could learn from others. That very idea is anathema at this point. The only thing that we're seeing, this drumbeat from the state, is the idea that China is right about everything, that the re rest of the world is against China, that the Chinese system is the superior one, that China's decisions can't be questioned. And that's gone along, of course, with this hardening of attitudes towards, this, towards internal dissent, the crackdown on lawyers, the crackdown on human rights activists, the crackdown on NGOs, the crackdown on religion, the crackdown on uh, ethnic minorities. Everything in China itself has become stiffer, um, more resistant to any criticism, um, and more determined in this notion of Chinese greatness, of China's rightful place in the world. Underlying all this, though, is a big question. And that question is this. Is time on China's side? And what I mean by that is, is it inevitable that in the next 10 to 20 years, China will continue to grow more powerful? The Chinese, that the Chinese economy will overtake the US economy in 2028 or 2030? That the Chinese military will come to rival the US military? That China's influence will be on a par with the United States? and that the future is only bright for China. And on the reverse, that US power is doomed to diminish, that the US share of the global economy will continue to shrink, that the US uh, ability to impose its values or its will or its whim on other nations will, um, grow, will grow smaller as China grows larger. It's very easy to, to say, yes, China is going to keep growing. China is going to get stronger and stronger and stronger because we've seen this amazing rise, these straight lines of growth. We've seen China climb the economic ranks from overtaking India to overtaking the United Kingdom to overtaking Japan. The, each of these moments celebrated massively inside the country. We've seen Chinese people go from being um, citizens of a uh, poor nation, one perceived as backwards, to being, um, for the urban middle classes, triumphant players on the global stage, tourists with money to spend, consumers with the power to buy and the power to shape global markets. On the diplomatic stage, China has become the foremost power at the United Nations. The, uh, the power with the ability to block, to coerce other countries into, into signing up to its measures. Um, Chinese companies have uh, become some of the world's largest. China has gone from being a, uh, from being perceived as incapable of creativity to being this massive innovator in financial tech uh, in uh, um, in solar panels, uh, in areas that were once seen as the domain of only developed Western nations. And so, futurologists always have this tendency to go by what's happened in the last decade and just see it going onwards, to see a China that will only continue to grow. And if you're the US looking at that, then you're then you feel inherently challenged. You feel, you feel that the only time that you can stop this is now. The only time that you can take action is now. And we see this rhetoric coming increasingly from um, policymakers, uh, from, uh, from think tanks, uh, from journalists, that the US hasn't acted. The US needs to act. The US must move on, uh, on countering China. But look at China another way. Look at a country that still has a GDP per capita lower than the global average, a country in which 400 to 500 million people are still offline, a 
country that is constrained by demography, thanks both to the natural changes caused by economic growth and by the limitations imposed by the one-child policy. That's a China where sunny time seems to be working against it, where the moment that China is enjoying now may be the greatest chance and the biggest influence China has. And if you're a Chinese leader, if you're Xi Jinping, you're looking at these figures and you're and you're thinking, can this continue? Can, can this growth, can this power continue? Or are we going to get stuck? And there's a fear that comes out quite often in Chinese commentary, less so in the last few years because commentary has been so stifled, so restricted, that China is going to get stuck, that it's going to get caught in the middle income trap that this is as, as far as China gets. And you can look back and Chinese professors, Chinese analysts have looked back at other countries that have come to close to the United States and say, and see where they didn't make it, see where the, the, see where the growth suddenly hits a cliff, see where things fall off. You can look at things like the um, failure of China to uh, ensure a high school level education for the, major for the majority of people, the kind of education that moving up the value chain in the long run depends on, a school system that in the countryside is falling apart. You can look at the burden or imposed by the one child policy of the inverted pyramid, where the current generation is stuck caring for two sets of parents, four sets of parents of grandparents and their own children, squeezed between the generational needs of uh, retirees and the demands of increasingly expensive schools and so on. We saw that coming out, for instance, in the almost panic in the Chinese media um, when the shift away from the one child policy failed. This happened a couple of years ago, there was this decision um, that pretty much everybody should get to have two children, should uh, be able, should um, have it, should have this limit that had been in place for uh, 30 odd years lifted. And Chinese media, Chinese analysts, demographers almost universally predicted a baby boom would result, that you would see this uh, sudden eruption of pent up desire for kids. And it didn't happen. There was almost no growth in the numbers. There was almost no um, like impetus of the change in policy because the factors that were constraining people from having kids at that point were not just government policy. They were the immense expense of, um, raising, of raising a kid in a Chinese city, especially compared to the average income of most people. The expense, not just of sending them to school sending them to university, but also of anticipating having to buy them, having to provide them property to get married, or the th having to uh, cover the costs in bribery, um, in influence buying needed to launch a career in the Chinese city. And so the, the, the people, as it were, looked at this opportunity given to them by the government and said, no. And that spurred another wave of, of panic, of fear, that there were just not going to be the numbers of young people needed to keep the economy going. So, if you're looking at all this, and if you're thinking perhaps time isn't on China's side, perhaps we're going to get bogged down in these limits that have held back so many other countries in our position. That raises the question of what you do with the time now. What do you do with the moment you have? And that raises a lot of dangerous possibilities because if, um, because if now is the moment of China's ascendance, Chinese, China's power, that moment won't last. You have to seize it. 
you have to move on it. And what's the main what what's the main way that you uh, that you turn that new turn that that moment of power turn that moment of advantage into something permanent? It's by territorial revanchism. It's by taking back these areas such as Taiwan, such as um, the Himalayan borders that have been claimed by China for so long, but not realized on the ground. And if the Chinese leaders are thinking that way, if they are thinking that this is our moment, this is a chance we can't miss, it massively raises the stakes of what's going to happen in the next few years. Because they have, because if they're thinking this way, they have one shot. They have a, a chance now to um, imprint uh, Chinese territory, Chinese power in a way that hasn't been conceivable before and may not be conceivable afterwards. And on a personal level, they have a chance to make themselves as leaders the man who took the men who took back these territories, who took back Taiwan, who took back uh, who took back the uh, um, the disputed Himalayan borders, who took back who who stamped. Chinese rule permanently into Xinjiang or into Inner Mongolia, who uh, who are fundamentally like the shapers of the nation in the same way that their father or their grandparents' generation were in the creation of the new China. So that's one possibility or one fear that I have. This idea that there that there's a, a belief that this is China's moment and that it can't be wasted. But here's the other fear. On the US side, we have this belief that uh, China's rise is inevitable, that, that uh, unless stopped, that it must be stopped now. And so this is kind of the reverse of the pattern that I think is emerging within the Chinese leadership. Um, the US, the US believes not that this is China's moment, but that this is the only US moment to stop China. And that means that um, where that China can't just be weighted out or challenged in the long term, China must be confronted. And so we're seeing all these measures, all these policies wrapped together uh, around this idea of confronting China. And while China, see, while China perhaps sees this as the, the moment it has to act, so does the US. It sees this as, um, and it sees this as the moment that it can recover a sense of national purpose, a sense of national well-being by confronting China, by making China into the um, determining enemy of the day. One of the ways that, that materializes in DC is the obsession with the idea that China policy is bipartisan. In part, that's because almost nothing in DC is bipartisan these days. So the idea that a policy could be bipartisan, could have both Democrats and Republicans enthusiastically backing new measures against Chinese influence, against the Belt and Road, against China's military buildup, is inherently exciting to policymakers. They see it as the foundation of a new continuing American order, a new way at which um, DC can put aside the breaks and fragmentations of American democracy um, and project itself out into the world. Because Wonkish DC is fascinated with this, with this notion that you, that you can do something that isn't political or isn't domestically political. There's a couple of reasons. One is that the limitations of think tanks um, mean that bipartisan policy is always more attractive because um, it, it gets attacked less, it opens you up less. And the other is that if it's bipartisan, the money will flow towards it. And China fulfills both of these needs. But for China to be this urgent enemy, this, um, this power that must be struck against now, it had China can't be a, can't be something that can be weighted out. If we we think of it in terms as we can just keep going, 
we can run, as it were, delaying actions. We can um, continue promote. We can continue with the things that the U.S. has been doing before, whether that's promoting democracy, um, freedom of navigation operations, these kind of things. We can stay on this steady course, and China will diminish, or China will um, China's sense of new power will shrink by itself. That takes away that urgency for funding. That takes away that urgency for um, military buildup, for contention. And so, these two, these two great powers, these uh, each locked into the notion that it has to act now, are heading straight towards each other straight towards a crisis in the Taiwan Straits, straight towards a, um, a straight towards a clash over some littoral in the South China Sea, straight towards um, uh, economic decoupling um, on a scale that would have been unimaginable five years ago, where um, connections to the other power are seen as inherently treasonous or, an, or inherently um, aiding the or inherently is aiding and supporting uh, a strategic opponent um, as opening you up to espionage. The two have started to mirror them, to mirror each other in terms of their own paranoia about uh, the intrusion of the other. Now, when I say this, whenever I talk about US China mirroring, we're still talking about this with the proviso that the US is a somewhat functional democratic state with the rule of law, and China is very much not. So things that happen um, in espionage paranoia inside the United States are inherently constrained in a way that they are not in China. But that said, we've seen a wave of um, arrests of, Chine of Chinese Americans over um, relatively minor or technical offenses. We've seen a, a, we've seen a wave of um, uh, talk of discussions by um, U.S. security and intelligence community leaders of China as an all of society threat. Things that um, frame China, frame Chineseness as being inherently threatening, that posit Chinese that posit Chinese immigrants, even Chinese Amer even Chinese American citizens as inherently risky, inherently a security worry. Um, and with this too, we've seen this rush of anti-Asian attacks in the United States over the last uh, like six months to a year, particularly the last couple of months, attacks on elders. Um, attacks being carried out by people who are often mentally ill or homeless um, or otherwise desperate, but which reflect uh, language and fears that permeate the U.S. system right now. On the Chinese side, way before this, we've seen a massive uptick in the number of arrests in so-called espionage cases. Uh, we've seen for National Security Day, which was yesterday, the announcement, um, the, the gleeful, the boasting announcement of the arrest of a 20-year-old student for uh, listening to anti-Chinese to anti-Chinese media, for um, for starting a blog that posted articles about China, for for working at foreign media, um, news assistants at Western media in China, and news assistants, by the way, is the term used to describe Chinese journalists working for Western media, but they can't legally be called journalists, and so they get this somewhat ridiculous title of assistant. Whereas in reality, they're often the ones doing the bulk of the work. Uh, but a, um, a bunch of them arrested, harassed out of their jobs, um, their parents threatened, their, um, their friends interrogated and intimidated. That, that's gone double for any uh, journalist working outside of China, such as Vicky Xu in Australia, uh, where there's been um, a, a massive hate campaign launched on social media against her. 
And so, and so while they're mirroring each other, while both are going through this period of intensified paranoia, the Chinese version is worse. The Chinese version comes without any access to legal counsel. It comes on a much vaster scale. It comes um, with the um, brutal intimidation of friends and family. But they still look like each other. They still have the they still have the sense that the um, that each power is deeply and fundamentally afraid of the other in this moment, afraid that it will lose the chance it sees to rise or to stop the rise. Accelerating this is the breakdown in lack of knowledge of each other. And this has very different roots on each side. On the US side, it's simply that uh, US journalists are no longer able to work in China for all intents and purposes, the Western journalists as a whole. There's been um, dozens of journalists kicked out of China or denied the ability to go into China to report a more or less blanket ban on new journalist visas in the last uh, year and a half. Um, the, only, the, the only one I think that's been issued has been a, a single one to a Japanese news outlet. Uh, we've People are stuck for six months, nine months in uh, Taiwan, in Seoul, waiting for the, even the chance to try and come into China to report. And as well as the formal bans, we've seen, um, we've seen journalists being chased out of the country by direct harassment or threats, such as John Sudworth of the BBC, um, who left abruptly because uh, there was the chance that he was going to face a, a trumped up lawsuit over his reporting on Xinjiang um, and have an exit ban imposed on him. So we've had that loss of journalists. Coupled, coupled with that, we've had a loss of a lot of the ways that we used to be able to see into ordinary Chinese life or get some sense of Chinese public feeling. Now, that was mostly being done through the through the internet in the in the early 2010s because the arrival of the internet and the boom in social media created these huge opportunities to see Chinese provincial and Chinese rural life for the first time. Uh, you were getting these you would get these stories of localized corruption of of officials with uh, displaying too many watches on their wrists and being hunted down for anti-corruption by bloggers online of rapes in small villages, of success stories of entrepreneurs who boomed under the new possibilities. But that's gone. And that's gone because the Chinese internet itself has been closed off, not just to Westerners, but internally, because uh, the crackdown on Weibo, the um, smashing of the so-called big Vs, um, the uh, verified users who who drove the sort of uh, liberal discourse in China. The um, arrival of um, national of intense ultra nationalism promoted and sponsored by the government online that drowns out all other stories. That's destroyed any sense, um, any ability we had to really read what was happening in China on the ground where journalists couldn't go. Because remember, Western journalists were very limited, deliberately limited in the cities they could live in. Um, the J visa uh, stuck you in um, essentially Shanghai, Shenzhen, uh, Beijing. And it, where, even when you traveled provincially, there would be security forces following you, harassment and so on. Now, that was always a limited window. It was always a, a narrow, uh, a narrow view on a vast country, but it was uh, the only one we had, and it was a tremendously useful way of um, seeing ornate Chinese life, of seeing um, the poor, the rural, those who don't normally get a voice. On. And as those, and as the number of journalists has diminished, and as um, the ability of uh, Chinese to reach out to 
the rest of the world has diminished with it. That's inevitably meant that the stories being told about China are the kind of stories that you can do from um, Taiwan or from Seoul or from DC. And those tend to be stories about things like rhetorical aggression, military buildup, um, surveillance technology, um, Chinese presence in Chinese presence in other countries. What's absent from that has been the small, the sorting of human stories that once gave the foreign public a sense of the Chinese as people, not just as a threat or as an or as objects or as members of this malevolent surveillance state. These stories were often kind of daft. These stories were often things like skateboarding in China, um, you know, Chinese discover hip hop. Uh, they sometimes had a, a slightly orientalist tone to them, a, a tone of like wonderment that the that Chinese people were people like people anywhere. But nevertheless, they were uh, important leavening in coverage that um, gave that gave the West some sense of Chinese being like them. But as the walls have come down, that's disappeared with disastrous consequences. It's one of the reasons why it's one of the reasons why COVID was not taken seriously by the West, by much of the Western public or the Western leadership, because we were not getting stories um, on the ground. We were not getting the kind of reactions of ordinary Chinese people that we could have got. Well, and if we did see them, they were not being taken seriously because they were being framed in a they were being framed as something that was other, that was that were worlds and lives completely apart from ours. And so the sense of panic in China, the sense of fear over COVID did not translate to the West. Chinese lockdowns were treated as something that was um, purely a, a, a result of a, of a dictatorial system rather than the, as a, a measure against a rapidly spreading pandemic. Chinese lives were not taken seriously with the result that um, lives all over the world were lost. On the Chinese side, the problem of knowledge is a little bit different. There, what you have is not a lack of information about the West. After all, um, the West churns out information about itself. There's nothing the, the American media loves to cover more than America. But what results within the Chinese system is nevertheless um, a distortion a distortion for two reasons. One is that Chinese officials, and this is a long-standing problem, but one that's worsened uh, under Xi Jinping. Chinese officials fundamentally believe that the rest of the world works like China, that, um, that, that democracy is a fraud, that powerful interests um, manipulate, uh, manipulate or shape the public everywhere, that, um, uh, that the that the real players are invisible, and that the media cannot be telling the truth. That the media must be censored or limited um, in uh, in the way that it is in China. And they read Western media through that light. If you talk with high-level Chinese officials, as I have, this becomes quite obvious because when it, whenever you raise something that goes against their worldview, whenever you say, um, "But there's a powerful." Whenever you say, but you know, there's a, a powerful civil rights lobby in the US, they, they say, oh, but that's really controlled by X. Their worldview is so inherently conspiratorial because the Chinese system itself operates through a series of interlocking and fairly obvious conspiracies against, um, within the party and against the public, that they can't understand a system in which openness is possible. Limited, but possible. Now, on top of that, which has always been a problem, you have the new inability of the system to tolerate any, uh, any information that goes against the official line. And it used to be that there was a discrepancy between the, the outside version and the inside version, that you obviously had um, propaganda, you had uh, highly controlled media and so on, not as controlled as it is now, but 
are highly controlled nevertheless. But on the other hand, you had um, a, whole, a whole series of channels within the government, within the party that were relatively honest. You had, in, you had internal, what were called internal reports produced by Xinhua staff, uh, the Chinese news agency, um, that went directly to leaders that tried to give fairly blunt assessments of the situation in China or the situation in foreign countries. You had the equivalent of uh, dissent channels. Now, the, the, you, may, you may know the dissent channel in the State Department is a way essentially that a, um, a member of ambassadorial staff can register uh, a complaint um, when they feel that US policy is mistaken. And surprisingly, that was a, those channels existed within the party system as well. They, um, they, weren't, they were riskier because objecting to your superiors in a hierarchical party state is always risky. But they, uh, um, but they were there and they were somewhat effective. When Xi Jinping came in though, and when his anti-corruption campaign effectively purged the system, not just in one kind of expulsion, but in this ongoing series of um, uh, falls of high-level party members, uh, crackdowns on local officials, um, determinations to stick to the party line, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That destroyed the ability of the system to dissent internally. Uh, the uh, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs dissent channel was literally abolished in 2013 or 2014. The um, internal reports written by Xinhua became um, much more muted in their language. It started to, uh, started to say only what their superiors wanted to hear. Um, ra as the demand for, for following one political line grew, so too did people who had dissenting opinions start taking themselves out of the system, retiring to other jobs, moving to the West, staying silent. And political mediocrities, um, people, with, people who had, had no great talent of their own, except an ability to sniff out the political wind, started to rise. That produced this um, burst of wolf warrior diplomacy, of aggressive nationalism, by Chinese diplomats targeted at following the uh, the line they think will please home rather than attempting to appeal to their whole countries or um, the rest of the world. As And as those political mediocrities rose and were put in key positions, like Zhao Lijian at the um, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who went from being a minor consulate um, official to being the, the, the spokesperson for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, so others inevitably um, followed that line, went along with this. So you have an entire system of yes men, an entire system that cannot contradict um, the official line, that cannot say we are making a mistake. You're seeing a few, you're seeing a few kind of um, limited efforts to try and go against the tide. Uh, Yang Shui Tong at uh, Tsinghua University, for instance, um, talking about the dangers of wolf warrior diplomacy. But they, but those efforts get censored. They get shut down. They have no power, no grip. So, a U.S. that's increasingly unable to see China as a place full of people, as a, uh, as another human society rather than an enemy, a China in which dissent against the official line is stamped on with brutal force. This is a recipe for disaster, uh, and this is something that is going. This is something that is going to play out in the form of crisis. Um, I would guess sometime within the next four years, um, a crisis that is going to require a level of diplomatic skill, of willingness to back down by both sides, uh, and of um, belief that problems can be tackled in five years time or 10 years time instead of now, that I'm not certain 
either side has those capabilities at the moment. I'm more, cap I'm more confident of the Biden administration's diplomatic ability than I was the Trump administration's. Um, I'm not at all confident that the Chinese side has the diplomatic or political capacity to back off from confrontation. What can we do about this? What can people like yourselves who are coming into this, who are coming into this field, who are um, moving into being analysts, being government employees, looking to make careers that, looking to make career, careers in this broad field of US-China relations, what can you do? Well, the truth is not a lot because you, um, none of us can do a lot as individual actors, but we can stick to a, to a certain set of principles that will help. One of them is just to remember the humanity of the people on the other side. And I mean this in, in two ways when it comes to China. I mean, both that we need to consider, um, that we need to consider the lives, um, the hopes, the ambitions of only, of only Chinese people, including those who are most persecuted, most crushed by Beijing at the moment, such as the Uyghur. But we also need to remember the, we also need to remember and think of Chinese officials as individual actors themselves trying to survive in an incredibly paranoid, intense political environment. Uh, and we need to try and build in ways for them to be able to back off from language or avoid crisis that do not put them at political danger at, at home. Um, we've done this before. We've dealt with the we've dealt with regimes like this before, um, Soviet the Soviet Union most most vividly, but we've lost some of that institutional memory in how we handle these situations. And the other principle I would say is just to remember that that, it, that perhaps there isn't this crisis moment. Perhaps China is going to settle into a role as a second power simply by weight of demography, of economic stagnation, um, of all the problems that developing countries have fallen into after 20 or 30 years of growth beforehand. Maybe, maybe when it seems like this crisis, the sensible thing to do is just to wait and see what happens, not to try and force a moment, um, not to try and create a confrontation between two vast powers, both of whom are stuck in a web of domestic nationalism and fear of the other, both of whom sense and sense the need for immediate action both of whom have nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. Um, I, and let's uh, go to the audience and take some questions. Thank you, Mr. Palmer, for this fascinating uh, speech. Uh, I'll start off with a leading question. Uh, at the beginning of your uh, presentation, you talk a lot about demography. I wonder why is that important and why is it such a big issue in China? Because my general impression is that demography, fascinate, the fascination on demography is a pretty outdated concept, like pre-World War One, maybe. So, I mean, demography is demography is the foundation of economics to a large degree, just in terms of the working age population, and that's the thing that that causes the most um, consternation in China is the idea that you may have um, that this. Um, that the generation of, of parents of the one-child generation, um, the parents of the one-child generation are now retirees or about to become retirees. Because remember too that the retirement age is very, very young in China. That's left the one-child generation, a shrunken generation, support it, um, financially supporting this older generation. Um, to, in, um, it's left Chinese. Uh, it's left Chinese factories and Chinese with workforce shortages that have already been materializing on the ground, that, um, with concerns over ra uh, over rising labor costs. It's been one of the impetuses pushing companies to move from China to Vietnam or Indonesia. Now, there's still many factors on Chinese side there. China has a much more developed infrastructure, but um, the combination of 
more expensive labor, greatly increased political risk, um, and, uh, and relatively, um, and a relative actual lack of educated labor, uh, our educated labor to, to the sort of a high school graduate standard that still persists in China is causing a lot of um, companies to rethink uh, to rethink whether they want to be in China even before the you you add in the uh, effects of forced decoupling at the US end. And then I and I think fundamentally the the worry is just will we have enough people? Will we have an and not not that there's a not the fear of um underpopulation but the fear of an aging population of an of a population that just doesn't have enough young people to support it. Now we've seen those fears in Europe and America too, but the solution there has been, e I'm not going to say easy, the solution there has been easier because immigration is part of the narrative of those countries, is part is an accepted uh, political need, um, or not accepted by everybody, but um, the US has a very, the US has a relatively young population compared to most of our countries, in part because it has this constant stream of immigrant talent. China has almost no immigration. Um, it has, uh, except the exception is a, a certain degree of, uh, of marriage immigration, um, uh, brides from Southeast Asian countries and so on. It's not done a good job in making itself seem like an attractive immigration option, even for countries that are poorer than it. Um, and its own domestic narratives of ethno-nationalism um, uh, position anybody coming in as non-Chinese, as not being able to find a permanent place in China. And I think all of that combined creates uh, a real problem. Again, a problem that we've, we're have also seeing in South Korea and in Japan, but Japan has the immense advantage of being a much, much richer cap per capita country than China. Um, it, South Korea is also richer per capita, South Korea has also deliberately attempted to foster multiculturalism and foster an atmosphere of welcome, of welcome to immigrants in the last 10 years with mixed success in a way that is currently very hard to imagine the Chinese government doing. Thank you for, for answering my question. We uh, just want to remind everyone that if you have any questions, please type it to the Q&A session and we'll try to answer it one by one. And now we have a question from Ardem. Uh, he's asking, could you please touch upon Chinese? Uh, wait, the question jumped off. <laughs> wait, what? I think it went to, uh, I think it may have gone to answered, Jay, there we go. Yes. It's, uh, um, so Chinese increased military and civilian presence in South America and Africa and what drives this expansion? So, I only really know the African side of this. I haven't, I haven't looked at the South American situation um, closely, so I'm going to mostly talk about that. Partially, it's just the the natural need for resources. Um, we've always had this situation with the West, where uh, Africa is this tremendous source of resources, and so there's been a, a for you know um, 140 years a huge Western presence, first in the form of colonialism, um, and then uh, in the form of uh, business and uh, post-colonial power like France's, like France's um, military presence in West Africa um, in order to extract these resources. And China is in the same boat and it's not surprising or I think worrying that China wants a share of African oil, of African rare earths, of African diamonds. Now, the question is, is in doing so, does will China repeat the same kind of horrors that the West inflicted upon um, Africa historically. And I don't think so. I think, you know, these are not great arrangements. These, these are arrangements made with somewhat corrupt um, African elites that allow this extraction, but so are a lot of the Western arrangements. So is, um, so is ELF, the French oil company, for instance. Um, there's, uh, and I don't think it, and I think we should be fairly blasé, fairly calm about China looking to fulfill these needs. And I, if we overreact react to them, I think we just generate more fear on the Chinese side that anything China tries to do, any, legitim any legitimate Chinese action will result in Western pushback or counteraction. And so we need to distinguish very clearly between things like China's lending to um, developing nations or, um, or um, 
Sinopec's presence in Africa that are well within the bounds of legitimate state action, as opposed to things like the genocide of the Uyghur or the um, destruction of freedoms in Hong Kong, uh, the breaking of international treaties, most of all, uh, or the, uh, the threat of invasion of Taiwan. Um, if, if we see every Chinese action as a threat, we lose the legitimacy to talk about the Chinese actions that are genuinely problematic, that are, that are genuinely challenging to the international order or that are moral horrors. One, one more thing that there's a, you get, there is a, there is a strand of thinking inside China that sees uh, Lebensraum in, in Africa. Um, that, that there are these, there is talk in Chinese military forms and so on, and sometimes in Chinese strategy of like, China's settlement in Africa, it's, I think, a fantasy and, 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 and a non-starter. I don't think there's any, other than, you know, the, the other same things that have driven the Chinese diaspora worldwide, like trading, there's, there's no real possibility of colonialism in the, set, in the sort of 19th century sense of, of settlement of Africa um, by China, because there just isn't the, the will, the desire of Chinese to go and, to go and live in Africa on mass, and because African nations are um, sovereign nations that have the ability to to to, to push back against that in a way that they didn't a, a century ago. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that uh, ideally, if you can, please leave your first name uh, for the questions. Uh, our next question came from an uh, anonymous attendee, and his question is. Why is the U.S. coming closer and closer with Taiwan at this moment with arms sales and bids? Doesn't this provoke China greatly? Do you actually think that China will invade Taiwan in the near, near future if the U.S. doesn't protect Taiwan? Or is that an overreaction by U.S. officials? So I, I always dislike this language that's saying that protecting Taiwan or aiding Taiwan is a provocation because it raises the question of why should why should why is the U.S. offering aid to, to Taiwan a provocation, and China's constantly threatening to invade or dominate Taiwan not a provocation? Like the simply because the Chinese demand that they should be able to crush a neighboring democracy um, is a constant demand doesn't mean it's not a provoc doesn't mean it's not a provocative one. Again, we've seen uh, not only that, but on the ground we've seen. Um, daily provocations, the constant overflights by China, uh, um, by China of Taiwanese air defense space, massively increased rhetoric. And again, because the Chinese rhetoric on Taiwan is so heated all the time, it sometimes becomes difficult to distinguish real threat from just bullshit talking. Um, the, this is a, a wider problem, actually. So um, I'm just going to divert into it for a moment. CCP, CCP language, since, um, since its foundation, has been the language of war because it started off as a militant party. It became a wartime party. It used, it kept that wartime language um, in, well into the Maoist period. So this language of crush, break, oppose, against um, is very um, normalized in Chinese political speak. Um, and the problem with it being normalized is it often doesn't mean anything. It, it's it's often just the the metaphors and the rhetoric that's that's so normalized that people don't even see it as aggressive. But that makes it very hard to tell to tell apart when the Chinese state is just talking bullshit or is talking the normal level of like you know we we will fervently oppose separatism ta -da 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 -da, and when it's actually upping the ante. Um, and if you spend if you spend a lot of time reading this stuff as I do, as others uh, as other experts do, you kind of get a nose for it. But it's always it's always like a judgment game. It's like looking at a it's like trying to it's like trying to tell if an old bridge is going to fall apart uh, when you cross it this time when it's always when it always shakes and creaks as you do so. So I would say. Um, the, I would say the there is, there is I think, not a definitive chance that, the, that China is actually going to invade Taiwan, but given that China constantly talks about how it may invade Taiwan, given that it, um, given that 
uh, quasi-state agents like Hu Shijin of the Global Times um, talk about crushing killing Taiwanese, I don't think it's unreasonable for the US to respond by increasing its defense of Taiwan in, in return. Um, on top of that, um, we, we've already seen the existing order of Taiwanese-Chinese relations destabilized by Taiwanese democracy itself. Um, in the 2000s, it was conceivable for China that, again, the course of events would eventually take Taiwan back into their orbit. And it was even conceivable for many Taiwanese that China would evolve to a state where some kind of deal with the mainland was acceptable, where, um, where you could have a quasi-independent Taiwan because China had maybe not democratized, but reformed um, or changed enough to a point that those deals could be trustworthy. But of course, what were they looking towards there? They were looking towards Hong Kong. And what happened in Hong Kong, all those promises were broken, all the ambitions of Hong Kong democracy were crushed. Um, and whatever trustworthiness China had in the eyes of uh, Taiwanese was destroyed. And that's why we saw, we've seen such um, a boost in the anti-China camp in Taiwan, where we've seen um, figures that are, that are seen as allying with China, as favoring China's interests, destroyed in elections after bursts of initial popularity. And that, I think, is a, a, a choices and, uh, frankly, smart choices made by the Taiwanese people themselves in terms of who can be trusted. And I want to add that the security panel tomorrow uh, deal with Chinese naval buildup and marine time ambition. And I'm sure the panel will also touch upon the issue of Taiwan. And our next question from the audience is that during the Cold War, it was pretty clear that the ultimate foreign policy objective was of each side global hegemony. It is still pretty clear what the current US, policy, US foreign policy is, maintaining global power. But what is China's ultimate foreign policy goal? Does it want to replace the US or just want to be considered as an equal power? Or is it something else? So I would say that the main Chinese foreign policy goal is to destroy the possibility of any threat to the domestic Chinese political order from the outside. And that may, China's, um, China's active, um, China's foreign policy is always primarily domestically directed. It's always directed at domestic politics or domestic fears. And if you look at uh, modern Chinese history, the support from the Chinese diaspora for revolutionaries, support from the outside for communists or nationalists or whatever, has always been a critical factor in determining um, in determining uh, the future of China politically. And I think that more than anything else, what the CCP wants is for the rest of the world to shut up about um, about. Uh, Chinese politics. So we've seen, what have we seen the main use of Chinese power be in the last year? We've seen it be to force Muslim countries to come out with statements backing the atrocities being committed against Muslim Uyghur by China. And that's the main thing that China has demanded from third powers, um, has not been um, basing or trade or so on. It's been limitations on speech. And so I, I think that that is the ultimate dream of the CCP is to be able to impose those limitations on speech worldwide to contain any threat to its own power. Now, that has a couple of consequences. One of them, I think, is that um, it's something that would be distinctly different if we had a, uh, a, non, a democratic or semi-democratic China. I think that there are ways in which a democratic China would still clash considerably with the US, but that's not one of them. Uh, it all, it also really affects like um, where we should be thinking in terms of putting our own influence, our own uh, our own pushback in ways that that matter. Um, though the question there is always is this does this actually can this actually help at the moment or are we just looking towards a time when politics in China will be different when openness in China returns? I don't think, and I, I think. There, there's a mixture of, a weird mixture of desire to be simply taken seriously and desire to, to 
control. And the desire to control comes out of that desire to control speech. The desire to be taken seriously, to be respected, comes out of the narrative, somewhat based in reality, of national humiliation. That is so deeply, deeply ingrained into um, the way that history is taught in China, into the, the vision of the world that the um, Chinese leadership has, this idea that China was humiliated and is, has now returned to its natural status, its natural power, and therefore must be respected. And that by itself is not an unreasonable demand. That's some, something that we could hope that all countries aspire to. The problem is that that, that, that often turns from, from the idea that China should be respected to the idea that, that uh, China um, inherently outranks or outweighs others because of its historical status and its historical place. And its size. So we, so we saw that, for instance, in the post-2008 atmosphere, when the Chinese ambassador to Vietnam was calling it a small country, with this idea that we often see that's from um, this paradoxical idea, because on the one hand, China has this leftover kind of um, communist rhetoric about the equality of all nations and so on. On the other, we see in practice on the ground um, this uh, this disrespect for the for the status of others so for um, particularly for Chinese uh, for Chinese small na neighbors the idea that they should naturally fall into line behind the Chinese order because that's what the historical order was the idea that that was the historical order is a mistake in the first place the historical order was all over the place but the idea that China is the natural leader um, is very much still there and we've seen it in things like when um, when Chinese journalists claim to be speaking for all Asians. This belief that China is, the, in particular, the natural leader, the natural power of Asia is very strong. And do feel free to ask follow-up questions on any of these as well, by the way, because if you, uh, um, like if there, uh, if there are things that you want to, to uh, push on on a question or ask about further, just pop it in the Q&A. And our next question is, uh, what would you advocate for any immediate policy changes? If we are not at a crisis moment, should the US lessen its pressure on China? So, um, I think that we should be, but that we should be backing off, not necessarily pressure, not, not necessarily pressure on China directly, but the rhetoric of pressure on China. I think that we can do a lot of stuff and not boast about it or call it anti-Chinese. I think that we can promote, for instance, if you look at the um, the bill that uh, was passed, uh, went from the Senate last week, I forget its name, it's something like the Comprehensive Security China Act, something along those lines. It's got a lot of stuff, it's got a lot of stuff in it that is um, stuff that maybe the U.S. should be doing, but the U.S. does not need to frame in terms of this being against China. So, for instance, it's got $100 million for independent media, but it frames expressly in terms of, like, examining, questioning the Belt and Road, pushing back against the Belt and Road. Now, firstly, the Belt and Road is kind of bullshit. Um, that's a whole whole nother question. The Belt and Road is not some magical Marshall Plan that's going to transform the world in China's image. The Belt and Road has been a bunch of boondoggles and push it and failed pushes and competition between Chinese companies and collusion with elites in other countries that's resulted in public pushback and generally a big old mess in the way that, that you know, um, foreign, aid, gen, foreign aid, foreign investment generally is. Um, but, and, you know, giving a hundred million dollars to, to develop independent media worldwide is a, a good thing. It's something the USA should be doing, the, um, particularly in, in the Chinese language where uh, the CCP has, has bought out a bunch of newspapers um, cut off a bunch of independent Chinese media, uh, Chinese language media, and so on. But there's no need for us to say this hundred million dollars is against the Belt and Road. That's just dumb provocation. That's just point. That's just pointing a finger where it doesn't need to be pointed. We should be doing these things anyway because they're good, like aiding other countries, um, but uh, bolstering independent media, supporting democracies. We don't need to frame them expressly as being anti-Chinese measures. The one area on which I do think that we should absolutely keep up pressure as like as absolutely as possible is on uh, Xinjiang because I think that forces that's forcing the Chinese state 
to back off in some regards on the atrocities on the ground, only some regards, um, and in the lot, but it's also causing um, people within China to question the necessity for this ethno-nationalist policy that's causing this pushback, causing this stigma in the first place. Uh, and, and, and I'm hoping that eventually we can get to a point where um, China see where um, China sees the Uyghurs being a U.S. problem, and therefore allows the kind of scale of mass immigration that we saw of Jews from the Soviet Union, for instance. I don't think there's any future in which there's ethnic reconciliation in Xinjiang in the next 20 to 40 years because the cruelty and the um, fear has been so absolute. But I think that we can that we ca if we keep up the pressure, we can push to uh, a situation that does. Um, allow uh, allow some degree of relief, and that um, potentially allows uh, allows Uyghur to flee um, in the long run, to to have a, a safe route and a route um, a, and a route to new lives elsewhere. Because the only real hope for Uyghur culture at the moment, um, the survival of the Uyghurs of people, is within the diaspora. I think we have a follow-up question on specifically re regarding uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, can you explain on your earlier statement on the BRI? Uh, okay, yes. so um, so I can point you actually to a few things we've written on, on, on foreign policy on this, but broadly speaking, okay, so the Belt and Road started as a relatively coherent and, um, you know, decently logical project of Eurasian connection. So that it would, um, that essentially a series of um, rail networks that uh, that would go across Russia, across Central Asia, to provide uh, new routes for Chinese trade, um, coupled with uh, coupled with the development of new ports and sea roads that would allow, uh, sea routes that it would allow maritime trade to be boosted between um, China and, and Europe or the Middle East. Uh, now, annoyingly, the, um, the annoyingly the the road part of this is actually the sea part, and the belt part is the land part, which has never made any sense to anybody. And I um, I honestly think that at some point somebody just mixed them up, and it was and they were too high level to correct it. Um, but the this was a you know decent idea. Uh, now it didn't really work out in practice because the only because of uh, Western sanctions on Russia, the only rail route that ever made that has ever made a profit um, here is the uh, initial chongqing Duisburg um, route, route that was set up before the Belt and Road by as a private initiative. All the others, all the other rail routes, all the other sea routes have just bled money. But when she came into power, he really latched on, he really used the Belt and Road as like his idea, his baby. And so all other foreign initiatives, all of all of China's foreign investments, all of China's dealings with the with other countries with other countries that weren't like clearly developed nations, so there's even developed nations like Italy, got lumped into being Belt and Road because um, because everybody wanted to please Xi or to um, and so you had, you know, um, I remember all over Beijing you had posters plastered with things like you know the uh, second ten the second Tianjin ba um, Baijiu factory supports the Belt and Road Initiative. All these all these companies that had nothing really nothing to do with it but that wanted to show political support. If you actually look at the investment numbers, if you actually look at the at, at, at the the money involved, it has gone up as at exactly the same rate rate or slightly slower since the Belt and Road Initiative started than than uh, than before the Belt and Road. China has been gradually growing its foreign investment for, for years as its economy improves. So, the, so in fact, on the ground, the, the money just hasn't particularly been there. And in fact, what you've had instead is a lot of is a lot of competing projects because companies would leap upon supposed Belt and Road opportunities and end up competing directly against each other to build, for instance, I think there's three different competing Chinese rail programs in, in Thailand, for example. So it's not that, you know, China has gradually built up foreign influence. China has uh, provided itself as a reliable lender to developing nations and so on. 
Uh, but there's no grand new model there. There's not even a, a huge wave of money with the Belt and Road. Almost all the figures that people throw around in the Belt and Road are theoretical figures or figures lumping together or any number of things over 10 years to try and make it seem bigger. Um, and the, the US panic about China's Belt and Road is going to transform the global order was very silly. And another follow-up question to the previous one on the Belt and Road Initiative is that is the BRI providing an authoritarian alternative to the liberal world order? And is China actually pursuing that trap diplomacy? I, I, I honestly don't. Okay, so debt, tra debt trap diplomacy, no. Like um, there have been a couple of cases where you could argue for it, but almost all the research of late has pointed to this as largely mythical. Um, as these as actually being fairly standard international lending practices, there certainly hasn't been a deliberate intention to create these uh, to create these debt traps. Very often, in fact, China has um, been the the loser in these deals. Um, and before two thousand before two thousand and fifteen sixteen, when um, the Chinese media just abandoned all ability to to criticize, you used to have a pretty constant stream of criticism in Chinese newspapers about Chinese companies' inability to operate well abroad because they did, lacked the the uh, cultural understanding, the nuance, the um, to um, to deal to, to actually deal well in a, a foreign environment. Um, in terms of the authoritarian order, kind of, but I don't think it's even that intentional. I think that yes, China will um, give out loans to states that maybe the U.S. wouldn't loan to, for um, or, or will back states that the U.S. wouldn't put him back, but so will a lot of other countries. So will Russia, so will a lot of Europe, so will the US itself in, in on many occasions. The US, the, the US's own record in um, wielding its power to promote democracy through trade is very, it's pretty shaky. Um, I think, and sometimes we've ended up with a situation where you have almost these client states that China doesn't really want, like Myanmar. So, um, China would have been very happy. China had a pretty good working relationship with the um, uh, the uh, Sukhoi's party, the NDP. Um, they were they were going they were going fairly well, and that was partially because China made no noise about the atrocities committed against the Rohingya, um, while whereas other uh, donors, other um, uh, other powers did. But this led the Myanmar military into thinking that China would would like really back it uh, in the coup in thinking even that the in, I think it was one of the factors in convincing them that a coup was a good idea in the first place and now we're stuck with this like blazing you know borderline civil war economic collapse that uh, you know China like uh, Ch China didn't want this China has has you know, we've seen Chinese businesses China, uh, Chinese firms attacked exactly because China has become so associated with the Myanmar with the Myanmar's military in the eyes of the Myanmar public. There's no advantage for China in that. There's just a, a huge bloody mess that's going to be laid at its that's going to be laid at its doorstep. So I would say that um, China is an authoritarian is an authoritarian alternative, but there are lots of authoritarian alternatives. Um, there are lots of powers um, competing in this space. Um, and also that there's just so much dumbness on a lot of the on a, a lot of the Chinese side. It's a little bit like you know um, the image of the the American the, the Americans abroad when they uh, in the 1950s when you'd have these you know CIA agents um, American trade ambassadors on blundering around the developing world um, not knowing what they were doing. China has that problem in spades. A great recent example of this um, was that. Um, Chinese Chinese intelligence got kicked out of Afghanistan recently. They lost a couple of dozen agents, I think, uh, because they were try they all they re all they knew about Afghan culture was that Af the Afghans were you know um, grew opium, and so they got a bunch of op and so when they held the meetings uh, with the Af with Afghan officials, they were like they, they were taking them into places where the apartments were like covered in pictures of opium pipes, and they had like and they had like opium there. And they're like, "Would you like some opium? We know you. We know you Afghans like opium." So this kind of 
you know, I think more than anything else with a lot of Chinese projects, we forget that they suffer from the same degree of incompetence as institutions everywhere do in dealing with the rest of the world. They're not, they're not super Machiavellian. They're not, they're, they're, they're not um, brilliant, like brilliantly planned. It's a big messy system that makes a lot of mistakes, but because it doesn't talk about those mistakes, because it's closed down criticism internally, we're often unaware of those mistakes until, and, until foreign reporting like finds them or they become so obvious that we can't miss them. Shall we take another question? Yep. And on a similar note, uh, Steve has asked that, can you frame how other autocratic lesser powers like Russia, Iran, or Turkey might see their place in the US-China standoff and how other Western allies like Australia or India, Canada, Japan, see their place? So, um, I mean, this is a lot of, this is a, a a lot of different countries with a lot of different answers. I would say broadly speaking that we're seeing an increasing Western alliance um, directed against China because of the level of rhetorical aggression coming out of China that has, uh, that has destroyed confidence even in countries that might previously sort of favor Chinese relations. So very obvious recent example of that, the um, CIAI, the uh, investment agreement with Europe is being scuppered because um, China pushed back so hard on Xinjiang, it sanctioned a bunch, sanctioned Merrick, sanctioned Swedish researchers and so on, um, did these blundering kind of Twitter appearances and so on that have really scuppered Chinese reputation. And Canada and Australia, uh, the, both Canada and Australia and, and Japan, the public mood has, for different reasons in each, swung violently against China. And so even with all the kind of skullduggery and nonsense of the Trump era, even with all the reputational damage done to the US by Trump, they're still coming in, even even, even at, uh, by the end of 2020, they were still coming in on the US side on this. Um, and I think we'll continue to do so because I think the level of uh, sort of, um, like uh, the, 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 the level of like um, retaliatory measures coming from China will continue to increase against all of these states. And it becomes again a cycle as they as they um, as they align closer to the U.S., so so China uh, does more things like unofficial trade bans, kidnapping of Australian or Canadian citizens, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that feed that just feed into this desire to get closer to, to the U.S. You know, um, the author the the authoritarian states, using the label broadly, I think um, are happy to go along with the Chinese ride as long as it frustrates America, basically. Are happy they um there's always been this kind of um you know will russia and china break off because they have these old disputes about siberia because the russians are pretty racist or this kind of thing and i just don't think it's going to happen as long as the us is there like absent the us or if or if the us like genuinely fell to this to not to not being the first power i think we'd see more divisions emerge but as it is i think like the, the shared anti-us feeling is strong enough to keep them uh, to keep them together. India is the weird one because India is a country that the way things are going under Modi might seem, you know, it's authoritarian tilt would, would normally, we might say, put it in perhaps conflict with the West um, and perhaps sympathy with China over things like the oppression of Muslims. But the truth is the Indian and Chinese conflict is so purely geopolitical, so, uh, so much um, competition over the Indian Ocean, over the Himalayas, that that overrides everything else. And so in fact, we're seeing India tilting far more strongly towards the US than it has done for since really, uh, since independence. Um, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see even more like formal US Indian alliances against China. More than anything else, you know, the killings at Doklam, the um, just sparked this big, big old wave of uh, anti-Chinese feeling in India. And I think there's, there's going, um, you're going to get more of that partially because um, the demand for for nationalist measures for um, for demonstrating political fervor in China is going to push more Chinese Indian bo uh, border conflicts. Oh, 
unfortunately, we're running out of time. Thank you, Mr. Palmer, for giving us this uh, fantastic presentation and answering our questions. I want to remind everyone that we're taking a short break for 30 minutes and we'll be returning at 3 p.m. Eastern East Coast time. For the cultural panel, uh, the topic this year is the development of the Chinese film industry. And once again, please everyone join me in thanking Mr. James Pamela for giving us this fantastic speech. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for coming today. I'll see you later at three.